and welcome back. So um, we will soon start our final session, session four about transformation. And just before we start the session, I'd like to let all our audiences know that uh, using the same drill, please feel free to um, put forward your questions via this Q&A tab. And for all, all of our panelists, you're more than welcome to um, place your answer to those questions directly via the Q&A features as you see appropriate. So after discussing the challenges and opportunities in the previous three sessions about inclusive diets, resilient food systems, and good food governance, now in this session, we're going to discuss key levers to catalyze transformation towards sustainable food systems and healthy and inclusive diets from farms to forks. Following the same drill, we will start the session with presentations from our four esteemed speakers, Dr. Francisca Gaub from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, who works on system risk modeling and food systems transition towards a resilient future. And Dr. Francisco Branca, Director at the Department of Nutrition for Health and Development at Ward health organization, the WHO, who has been working on designing and implementing nutrition guidance and policies worldwide for healthy life process. Betty Kibara, director in the Food Initiative at Rockefeller Foundation, the African Region Office, who leads the foundation's investment in transforming food systems, especially in establishing innovations on smart food markets in the global south and Professor Marco Springman, who joined us yesterday. And thank you so much for joining us today. Again, the co-director at the Center on Climate Change and Planetary Health at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and also from Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford, who explores the role of policy and economic instruments in facilitating food systems transition and diet reshapes. So now let's start our session. We will begin with Francisca's presentation. Francisca, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. And hello, everyone. Let me just quickly share my presentation. Yeah, it should work now. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, I work on food system transformation and specifically at this interlinkage between science and policy. And I will present today a little bit of my own work and also that of my colleagues. And as I'm the first speaker on this panel, I thought maybe uh, I'll start with a little bit of context provision. Um, looking at the entire food system as its whole, we know that it is a major um, resource use and has massive environmental impact. Uh, the food system, uses up 40% of global ice-free land, and the largest part of that, 80%, is used for livestock production. The global food system is also responsible for 70% of freshwater withdrawal, and again here nearly half of it goes for livestock production. And we account now that around one third of global greenhouse gas emissions uh, can be traced back to the global food system. But here it's important to mention that this includes really everything from the production to retail to processing to consumption and waste. So the whole food chain accounts for around one third of global greenhouse gas emissions, which shows how important the global food system is to, towards in our transition towards a sustainable future. It is also very strongly linked to diets and their impact on health. I will not talk about much about this because my co-panelists are much more experts on that. But I think to introduce the topic, we have a growing trend of overweight and obese people. At the moment, it's 29% uh, of population and the trend is rising. Uh, a study that I think some of my co-panelists have been involved in also found that 22% of deaths among adults are due to dietary risks such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, or diabetes. And we have also found that healthy diets are not affordable for a large share of the people. Uh, and here on the left uh, hand, you can see a key figure of the Eat Lancet Commission, where some of my co-panelists have also been involved in. And I don't want to talk much about it, but you see the one message coming from that picture is, we eat at the moment on a global scale way too much red meat and not enough uh, vegetables and fruits. 
The third uh, thing that I want to mention quickly as background is that we have still a growing population on a, uh, on a global scale. The projections at the moment say for 2050, we will be 9.8 billion people. And with that, we also have, of course, dietary changes and lifestyle changes. Uh, and my colleague Benjamin Wojcicki has estimated using their Magpie model that by 2050, um, food, global food demand will increase by approximately 50%. Um, and uh, specifically, uh, animal sourced food will be demanded more, it will be a doubling. So this has massive impacts then for the environment, and I will talk a little bit about those impacts of those trends on our global food system. Um, yeah, coming to my own work, um, we have worked in the Food System Economics Commission on the question, how do we transform the global food system and what is required to do so? And this is a little bit of full graph, so I will talk a little bit about the key, key parts of it. Uh, we see here we have 2020 to 2050, the time scale, and on the y-axis we have a range of food system indicators that could be um, health, that could be environmental impacts, etc. And what we do is we use global models, global land use models, to estimate different paths into the future from today till 2050. So you see here the upward trend to a business as usual if we don't change our behaviors at all. And what we want and what we are interested in exploring are food system development pathways, which are different pathways into the future uh, that bring us on a more sustainable pathway. And on the one hand side, we have measures and objectives that are required for that. So our modeling teams look into different um, levers, for example, technological advances or a dietary change, and they estimate with what changes do we end up in which place in terms of sustainability and what levers are then the key levers to bring us from a business as usual to a sustainable future. And this is then matched with some scientists to look and investigate the possibility of different policies. So that can be greenhouse gas taxes, subsidies for biodiversity or education uh, programs. And we don't even stop there because we have seen that just because you know in theory a different policy would bring you the required change does not mean at all that this policy is actually implemented. So we have added a third component here uh, depict as fourth, the political economy analysis, where we look into why certain changes are working and why other changes have not worked because of opposition to certain policies. So what coalitions need to be built and how do the people who have maybe disadvantages from policy changes, how will they have to be compensated to agree to a change? So the basic, one of my key messages I want to bring across here is to look into food system transformation, we have to go the whole way from modeling to policy and political economy. And so let's look a little bit into um, what my modeler colleagues at PIC are doing. They take those step stones or transformation clusters and can then uh, look in detail which variables and what changes in those variables would bring us to which change. Uh, they call it transformation clusters, and some of them are, for example, a transformation of education, um, inclusion as a key lever, uh, what they look at, um, environmental transformation, of course, uh, land protection, water protection schemes, um, livestock management transformation is also a key uh, lever, and what we will talk about today, or what I will talk about today, as this is a session on diet transformation, I will pick that out as a topic uh, that can be, for example, a transition to the Eat Lancet diet or zero malnourishment by 2050, which in very simple terms needs a very strong reduction in meat consumption. Um, it also includes food waste reduction. And what I will explore here in this talk now also is the possibility of alternative protein, uh, which is quite controversially discussed. So I look forward maybe to discussion of that later. And I don't know how much time I have, but I look quickly into alternative protein. And if I still have time, uh, then in a topic of where meat uh, reduction is actually a really uh, important political topic. So let's start uh, with alternative protein. This is work that is not yet published. Um, but what we wanted to do is to look into different ways of alternative protein because we feel there's a lot of discussion going on at the moment. It's quite controversially discussed with a lot of people strongly in favor and other people warning of it. Uh, and the first step is to understand what it actually means because often different terms are blurred and different mean different 
people, different people mean different things by alternative protein. So let's give a very quick overview. We have on the one hand, the very basic unprocessed plant-based protein, which is soy, lentils, beans, just the basic products. And we could basically already just consume them as they are totally unprocessed and would have an alternative protein source. Then we have the traditional processed plant-based proteins, which are the traditional products like tofu or tampeh. And then what is mostly referred to under alternative protein are the so-called next generation protest protein. So those are plant-based meat. For example, we all know the veggie burgers or the veggie sausages, which are based then on lentils or beans. And the other very uh, dis much discussed topic is microbial protein. So that's processed protein and this fermentation based meat, basically. So how that happens is that you have um, microbial biomass that is produced by microorganisms such as bacteria, yeast or fungi in bioreactors. And those microorganisms are fed by sugar, hydrogen or methane. And the last one that is also often discussed are new animal-based meat sources. For example, the cell-based lab-grown meat, which is a lot discussed in media because this seems to be very exciting, but we have to say this is not really on the market yet. So a lot of those discussions are very hypothetical, although very much discussed in media. And then we have insects as another potential protein source in the future. Um, it's also really important for me to mention that there is a the myth of a protein gap on a global scale. And this is often used uh, by NGOs or by startups who produce alternative meat products to say we have a protein gap that needs to be filled. And I just want to make clear that everything we know, we don't have a specific protein gap. Protein is only one of many nutrients that are missing in the diets of those suffering from hunger and malnutrition. So we have here an overview uh, comparison with calcium, vitamins, iron. So it is not the most um, most um, problematic missing uh, nutrient. And insufficient diets are mostly um, a result of poverty and a lack of access, not of protein specifically. And for us in the global north, there is a lot of marketing going on and marketing campaigns uh, about the healthy protein shakes and we need a more protein rich diet. And that is just not true. Like in our normal diet here in the global north, uh, we have more than enough protein intakes. So let's go into the study of my colleagues from my uh, group at PIC, led by uh, Florian Humpenöde. And what he did is he played around with a few scenarios on microbial protein. And um, what he did is that he has three substitution scenarios and he substitutes ruminant, ruminant meat with microbial protein. And the three scenarios are a 20, 50 and 80% substitution of ruminant meat. And the assumption is that a biological fermentation for the single cell protein production uh, works with sugar cane. So he needs to produce sugar cane that is grown on cropland as input. And the study used the MAGPIE model, which is a global econo bioeconomic um, land use model. And they used the SSP2 scenario, which is the most business as usual scenario going into the future. And they found actually quite interesting um, things. And the most surprising fact was that already a substitution of 20% with microbial protein of ruminant meat um, means that the pasture areas do not expand anymore, as you can see here in the second uh, from the left. Uh, it actually goes down even a little bit. In the business as usual, it would grow because we have under the SSP2 scenario, we have a protected increase in meat demand, so that would be uh, leveled out. Um, however, we still have a cropland expansion uh, because we need to produce the sugar. And if we go to the 15-80%, uh, we really see that the deforestation rate goes to zero and that we have a massive shift um, in, in land, use, land use changes if we would substitute um, ruminant meat with microbial protein. On the picture here on the right, there are also two interesting conclusions. Uh, one is that we have both, and you can see that here, we have both linear effects of a range of uh, environmental indicators, and we have also non-linear effects. So the linear effects um, refer to methane and nitrogen and water use, um, which means that the reduction depends on the level of the production. So the number of cows, if you want. So each unit of replaced ruminant meat yields the same reduction of environmental pressures. 
um, because it's directly linked to the number of cows. But more interestingly are the nonlinear effects of CO2 and deforestation. And that was really also a surprise to the modelers. And that comes or could be explained because the land use change does not depend on the level of the production, so the number of cows, uh, but of the structural change of production. So we don't have land degradation anymore and no changes in land management. Um, so to conclude this, um, the substitution of 20% uh, has already a nonlinear strongest uh, decrease of deforestation. So that means there's no pasture expansion anymore. So I would say that was a really strong and uh, surprising um, and I think also maybe encouraging result uh, that was published this year in Nature for people who are interested uh, in, in uh, exploring that more. And now let me look at the time. I think I do have a bit more time to look into my policy case, if that's fine. Um, I know, sorry, I had um, another few, a few slides on alternative protein. Uh, this comes from a literature review that we are currently doing, where we reviewed literature on all types of alternative protein and what studies indicate in terms of SDGs. And what we have found there is that in general, alternative protein products have a lower ecological footprint compared to uh, animal sourced meat. Um, in terms of what to use, land use, deforestation, etc., it also has lower GHG emissions. Uh, one study found 35 to 65% uh, lower uh, emissions in fermentation based milk production. However, the strongest differences are to beef. Uh, and not necessarily always compared to chicken and pork. Um, then in terms of what to use, you have to see also the difference between a, on a, if you do your study on the product level through life cycle analyses, uh, where you have substantially lower water use with microbial protein up to 80%, some studies have found. But if you look at the systems level, as my colleagues did, you have fewer savings because as I explained, uh, you substitute them uh, with, with grain production, of course. Um, in terms of energy, it is also very unclear. Uh, different studies have different findings. Uh, Fermentation-based milk, they found a reduction of 24 to 48%, which is quite strong. However, some uh, estimates on lab meat, lab-grown meat have found that it would require higher energy than animal-sourced food. And the microbial protein study by my colleagues have found that they have a similar energy requirement. In terms of societal development, it's also very interesting. And I think if you do a literature review, the conclusion was that there is a lot of uncertainty still because a lot of those products are not on the market yet. And then it depends with who you speak. If you speak with the, um, with the startups that want to bring those new products into the market, or if you speak with some critical NGOs, um, there is just a huge uncertainty about price competitiveness, for example. Some project that the um, price of alternative protein will be lower as animal food, animal source food, and that's the better and more affordable option. Some others don't see that trend. When it comes to health and well-being, it's also very interesting. I think something that we can say for sure is that in general, as I said already, you don't necessarily need uh, veggie burgers, if you just shift to a plant-based product, like fruits, vegetables, and more in general, more healthy diet, it's more healthy, it's the most healthy option uh, altogether. And the effects of alternative protein products depend, while some people say that you can artificially supplement uh, your, your alternative meat with required nutrients. Um, a study that was recently conducted with veggie burgers in the UK showed that actually as it's processed meat or processed alternative meat, uh, they have as same as traditional burgers, too much fat and too much salt and are basically not really healthy. In terms of employment effects, we have also massive uncertainty. We have some people who are very optimistic uh, and, and say that also farmers will be able to produce microprotein in their small bioreactors. But of course, we know also that at the moment, a lot of the investments are funded by the big uh, multinationals who invest heavily in startups. So I, I share the fear that um, with the current policies, we will not end up with a very just transition here. Um, yeah, so um, if I still have five more minutes, I would end with a last study or a comment that we have published this year, 
and to show the political dimension of the topic of meat reduction, and maybe something that not everyone is immediately connecting with the Ukraine, with the war in Ukraine and the invasion. Um, so this year, uh, Russia, when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, it, um, it, it was the spring in 2022, and Russia and Ukraine are major wheat exporters, and they're especially important uh, for the MENA region, Yemen, South Sudan, uh, who are very import uh, dependent. And of course, um, the, the, the public perception was the fear of hunger uh, and acute hunger in Northern Africa, which was of course totally justified by the rising prices of um, grains and also fertilizers. But the commentary that we uh, published was referring to the discussion happening in the EU, and Marco Springmann was one of the co-authors here. Um, and our criticism was that this um, fear of rising prices was used by policymakers and also by uh, media um, to portray the situation in Europe as if there were food insecurity and risk of food insecurity in Europe itself. And we uh, claimed that this was a false narrative uh, because those people, some of those uh, people, want to prevent the implementation of the farm to fork strategy, which was or which is a part of the EU Green Deal, and that aims to reduce environmental impacts and reduce meat production and reduce also pesticides and fertilizer use. And at the moment, the largest group in the EU Parliament actually opposes the implementation of farm to fork strategy because they are afraid that if um, the if they have uh, biodiversity restrictions or biodiversity regulations in the EU, not enough grain can be uh, produced. So that was the narrative. Uh, and what we argued is that the most effective way uh, to deal with that issue would actually be to reduce livestock production. And so uh, my colleague Marco Springmann did actually a little uh, calculation, and we found that um, the, the reduced livestock, uh, if we reduce the livestock feed in the EU by only one third, that could have compensated already for the grain and oil exports from Ukraine. So our suggestion was that instead of giving up biodiversity goals, we would rather uh, reduce livestock production, and in that way we would have a more long-term sustainable strategy. And what we saw that that was published in spring, and what we saw then over the summer uh, was that the Black Sea uh, Grain Initiative happened, and uh, there were exports from the region in the end. But what you can see, and this is the green uh, green uh, figure here on the right, is that still a majority of the grain was then actually not exported to the countries that were facing acute hunger, but rather to our European countries. The majority of that uh, was maize going to Spain, Italy, and the Netherlands for feed for uh, pork production or wheat production that also ended up on the shelves of Western Europe. So we wanted to show here um, that really this uh, meat production and the reduction of meat production can have extremely uh, political, can, can, uh, can be part of really uh, political debates. And to sum up, um, we, our suggestion was to reduce livestock production in the high income countries, uh, and that reducing the feed uh, would actually compensate for the losses from, from Ukraine uh, grain exports. And so to sum up, uh, our, we, uh, we argued for a shift to healthier diets with less animal products, for a reduction in food waste, to accelerate legume production in nature positive agriculture, and with that all together provide global food security. So ending my presentation, coming back to this graph uh, and to the work that my colleagues are doing, we've talked about diet transformation as one of the key levers for food system transformation. And what my colleagues are currently doing is to explore several pathways. And uh, so please stay tuned for their publication coming up probably in the next year. And with that, let me conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francisca. This is amazing presentation and we definitely look forward to see the new publication on this very timely and innovative topic. And uh, move on to the next, Francisco, would you like to start sharing your screen and give us the presentation? Thanks. Sure, thank you. Pleasure to be with you today. <laughs> Lovely to have you. Okay. Works. Okay. So uh, is that is that visible? Yes. 
Thank you. So I'm going to follow up from the very interesting uh, presentation by Francisca. Uh, first of all, by um, confirming what she said about the current uh, situation, and uh, you've probably seen this slide. This is the the uh, change in time in the number of people and the proportion of people who are living with food insecurity. And while uh, in the first decades of the 21st century, we had a continuous decrease, now we have seen actually a steady increase and uh, many factors there, the economic downturns, the climate change, uh, and uh, of course, most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine. Uh, so, but this is not uh, due to the fact that we don't produce enough food. We're actually able to produce enough food for all, uh, but uh, we waste the food and uh, we don't distribute the food uh, adequately. But, you know, thinking about uh, sustainability and uh, how to transform the food system, this is, of course, something we need to consider. But also we need to consider that uh, we have basically multiple forms of malnutrition in the world. I think Francisca already mentioned uh, the ep epidemic of, of obesity. You can see these are the multiple nutrition targets that we have uh, identified as really the key uh, driver for our action. And, and uh, you know, goes uh, uh, around the life cycle, starting from low birth weight, I mean, one child in four in India is born uh, with already with, with a form of malnutrition, which is uh, uh, intrauterine growth retardation or prematurity, so with low birth weight. Um, we have, of course, in children under five, uh, failure to grow or uh, frank wasting. And at the same time, we have, we have the overweight. And then we have the big challenge of uh, uh, micronutrient deficiency. I think a recent paper estimates this uh, to be uh, about 2 billion people in the world. We here uh, uh, decided to focus on anemia, which is you know, largely dependent on iron deficiency. As you, and as you can see, actually the prevalences uh, in women of reproductive age are increasing. So we do have still a nutrition challenge, which we have not been able to address. And then, uh, unhealthy diet and unhealthy diet is probably the biggest of the challenge we have. I mean, this uh, slide uh, is uh, an analysis done by the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation that is listing in order of importance the different uh, risk factor for, uh, for, for death. And uh, you see that dietary risk, uh, you know, is sometimes it's first, sometimes it's second, sometimes it's third, depending on the changing the estimate that, that we have, but you know, certainly among the top risk factor, and this is separate from the burden of uh, obesity and separate from the different forms of malnutrition I mentioned. Altogether, basically we can say that these different forms of malnutrition account for a third of global death, largely for cardiovascular disease, but you can see non-communicable disease and the red, red one is the actually communicable disease. So, so, it's a, so that's a kind of challenge we have. now. Now, focusing on, on unhealthy diet, uh, what are the key issues here? And, and on the right, you see, again, there is a ranking of factors. And I've, uh, I've uh, indicated with that uh, red mark, uh, the um, elevated levels of consumption. And, and with the yellow one, the low levels of consumption. So if we have to rank the different uh, uh, factors, we, we can say that, uh, you know, perhaps the biggest challenge is the amount of sodium in our diet. Then um, trans fat content, also the high uh, consumption of sugar sweetened beverages, uh, the, the uh, high consumption of processed meat or red meat come there in this list, but a bit lower down the list. And then there's a lot that can be done to actually improve the quality of the diet uh, by having uh, um, more consumption of whole grains, more fruits, more nuts, more vegetables, uh, more fiber, uh, more seafood, omega-3 fatty acids, more legumes. So you see largely, so we have on the one hand excess consumption, which perhaps is, is, is due to the way that food is, is uh, treated and processed, you know, the sodium content. But the big component here, the missing component is the fact that we don't have 
enough consumption of um, the important good positive elements of the diet, largely plant food. So we clearly have an insufficient consumption of plant food. We also have excess consumption of meat and processed meat, but you know, mainly we have you know, insufficient consumption of plant food. Why is that? I think Francisco already um, hinted at one of the issue, which is the, the, the issue of affordability. So it, I think it's a problem of availability, but it's a problem of affordability. Uh, we have 3 billion people in the world who cannot afford a uh, healthy diet. And on the left side of this slide, you see the differences uh, in uh, you know, different uh, socioeconomic groups. And you see that actually the problem of uh, uh, diet high in sodium, in particular problem of high middle income countries, but the problem of in insufficient vegetable, for example, is a problem of the, of the low income countries. So definitely we have an issue of, of inequalities uh, within countries and between countries. Now, what's our objective? Our objective is pr to provide a healthy diet uh, uh, and healthy and sustainable diet to all the world population. So uh, we define a healthy diet as a diet that basically addresses all the nutrition challenges, a diet that promotes optimal human growth and development and prevents the different forms of malnutrition, so undernutrition, macronutrient deficiencies, obesity, and diet-related uh, non-communicable diseases. Uh, what is this diet? This diet is a uh, diet largely based on fruit, vegetables, and legumes, nuts, whole grains, where we have at least 400 grams of fruit and vegetables per day, excluding the root vegetables, where we have uh, less than 10% of total energy intake from free sugars and less than 30% of total energy intake from fats, and where the fats are mainly plant fats, so unsaturated fats instead of the saturated and trans fat. And then where we have uh, less than five grams of salt per day and where we drink tap water. So this diet is, you know, is derived on, on health criteria and it would address those 8 million. Uh, Together with FAO, we also uh, tried to uh, see how we could define the sustainable healthy diet concept. And clearly the objective is to have dietary patterns that promote all dimensions of individual health and well-being. So the different forms of malnutrition, but at the same time have low environmental pressure and impact, are accessible, affordable, safe and equitable, and are culturally acceptable. So something that uh, um, it, it produces the uh, impact that Franziska was describing, and uh, at the same time would be uh, adjustable and adaptable to the different cultures. So um, we're not uh, asking everybody to consume the same diet, but we're, we're basically suggesting that a healthy diet and a healthy and sustainable diet can be consumed in all cultural contexts and can be made accessible, affordable, and safe. We define this a, a bit uh, better, and, and I know that uh, Marco is going to challenge us because this is not uh, adequately operationalized, but we'll, we'll be working on that. But in general, in general uh, terms, uh, uh, this sustainable healthy diet should be diets that start early in life with adequate breastfeeding and continue later in life with uh, 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 with a good combination of uh, minimally processed food and particularly focusing on the plant aspect, but includes a moderate amount of eggs, dairy, poultry, and fish. And the slide that uh, Francesca was mentioning from the Eat Lancet Commission was talking about increased consumption of red meat, but that's frankly only limited to high income countries. I mean, the same series of slides of the Lancet Commission indicate that low income countries have. Uh, consumption levels which are lower than what is would be acceptable. And so we need to, to basically have that uh, level of justice uh, also in the distribution of consumption of animal source food. Um, and then maybe I just would like here to, um, to mention the fact that, uh, you know, this definition uh, underlines that it is indeed a win-win. So we can have a healthy diet, which is a sustainable uh, diet. Uh, this is about what we consume and also how this diet is produced. Uh, so 
um, there is an element of, let's say, one health here, because we highlight the importance of, uh, for example, minimizing the use of antibiotics and hormones in animal food production, uh, also uh, to limit the use of uh, plastics in, in food packaging. And then, you know, we talk about the need to act uh, on, on the, uh, let's say, amount of consumption uh, which needs to be adequate. So, so we should avoid loss and waste both in, in our consumption because we overconsume or throw away our food. And then uh, in, the, in the way that uh, we preserve the production from post-harvest losses. So if the gap is around, let's say, the plant uh, uh, aspect, uh, uh, what is happening in terms of global food-based dietary guidelines? This is an analysis that uh, has been done by the Food and Agriculture Organization on 83 dietary guidelines uh, in the world. And I mean, you see that uh, to a certain extent, they are in line with the, with the gaps that have uh, been identified. So, so basically all of them say you should reduce uh, salt consumption. Uh, mostly, they say you should eat more fruit and vegetables uh, and you should uh, uh, reduce fat consumption or adjust the, the fat consumption, sugar consumption. But then when it comes to, for example, the uh, recommendation around meat, you see very few guidelines do have that recommendation on moderate meat consumption. So I'm putting this slide to say that there is an action that we need to take uh, to um, reshape somehow the narrative about what needs to be done to improve the quality of the diet. And, and definitely it is about uh, you know, improving the, um, the plant food aspect. You see there's no mention here, for example, of whole grain, which is also a processing issue. And then we need to uh, increase the profile of uh, the consumption of red and uh, meat and, and, and preserved meat, because that's not uh, a common topic. Now, uh, in terms of policy and, and guidelines, uh, uh, and policy and action, what, what needs to be done? We all know, uh, and I think again, Francesca was mentioning that, that uh, the action needs to be happening at the different levels of the food system. So it, it has to happen at the level of the food supply chain and at the level of the production of food. It has to happen at the level of the food environment, you know, the food which is around us and uh, uh, which uh, sh somehow shapes our, um, uh, the, our consumption and, and you know, at the level of, of people's choices and you know, consumer behavior. The Dutch guidelines uh, somehow uh, are used to particularly address uh, consumer behavior, to give messages, but you know, they could become somehow a charter for the whole food system because we need to find alignment. There's no point in recommending uh, to consume more plant food if the system is not making that plant food available uh, in terms of, uh, you know, having it in the shops, having it in the canteens and making it uh, uh, affordable to the people. So, so what kind of actions can we have to uh, really align to those dietary guidelines? There are some uh, good choices and some, some bad choices. So on the top, you see that what could be the good choices, some of the improvement of the production practices, uh, improved storage and distribution, also uh, addition of micronutrient either at the source through biofortification or to the processing food fortification, products that are reformulated to be more in line and more supportive of, of dietary guidelines. What should not be done is subsidies uh, for production of less nutritious foods. And we see that happening very often. For example, the big investment done in corn subsidies is directly supporting on the one hand, livestock production, on the other hand, the production of uh, um, uh, high fructose, glucose, uh, um, high, high fructose uh, uh, syrup, which is used as a very cheap sweetener in, in the system. At the level of the food environment, uh, um, everything that can bring more of the healthier food in, in the table and also encourage people um, to, to consume that food. And here I'd like to uh, say what are the six uh, actions that WHO is uh, promoting through guidelines and through advocacy. First and, and foremost, as I said, the reformulation with less salt, uh, uh, less sugars, uh, and uh, uh, better fats. 
Um, the second is about the, the pricing of foods through taxing unhealthy options. We haven't yet discussed the, the, um, the, the use of taxation also uh, to, to link it to the greenhouse gas emissions, but certainly in terms of healthy diet, that's our proposal. And at the same time, adequate subsidies uh, to particularly make the healthier food more affordable. The third one is uh, public food procurement, which is a very important measure. I mean, the um, number of meals that uh, public institutions uh, buy every day is enormous. And not only could uh, offer better food and better diet to the clients of those systems, children in schools, uh, uh, patients in hospitals, uh, uh, employees in public canteens, but it could actually drive the whole price structure and availability structure in the whole food system. The fourth one is about uh, um, making, helping people making the right choice at the point of purchase uh, by informing, uh, since we consume largely processed food, by informing uh, well uh, in, in, in a very understandable form for all the nutrient content of the food. So by having uh, front of the pack interpretive labeling uh, uh, that uh, point out the amount, uh, the excess presence of fat, sugar, salt, and energy. The fourth uh, measure, the fifth measure is about the addition of macronutrients uh, to the food, particularly uh, staple foods. And, and the last one is about marketing uh, uh, foods and beverages, particularly the one addressed to children. Uh, the investment there is uh, um, has no comparison with whatever we can do in, in public uh, campaigns. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop here, but my, really my main message is to say that uh, it would definitely have a win-win for health and uh, environmental protection. We have to have a comprehensive set of policies across the food system, but we can act on food environment and food consumption with a package of key policies. Because I think the risk is that uh, uh, although we need to have a systemic approach, uh, we, we uh, should be a bit more focused in trying to get countries to implement those policies which are proven effective at scale. And uh, sometimes countries are a bit overwhelmed by the complexities of our analysis. And, uh, and, and, and of course, they, they, they fight back. But there are, for the implementation of these policies, there are, of course, uh, uh, commercial determinants, uh, again, that Francisca was, uh, was uh, suggesting. So we look forward you know, the analysis uh, of, uh, of those determinants to, to see where we can act to, uh, to improve the implementation. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francisco, for this very interesting presentation. And um, you just walk us through the dietary change to food system change. And you mentioned a really important point about the implementation of the guidance and policies to make them effective and realistic. Uh, I will definitely um, pitch some questions to you later in our panel discussion. But let's move on to the next um, of our speaker, Betty Kirab Kibaran. Can you see my presentation? Yeah. All right, uh, let me see. Uh, so thank you so much for um, in, inviting me uh, into this uh, panel of esteem, uh, esteemed guests. Um, I'm actually dialing in uh, from Tanzania uh, where you know, we have some work which is going on around uh, the high iron and zinc beans. And thanks so much, Francisco. Uh, I kind of felt like you talked through my presentation on some of the work that we are doing, especially around the institutional procurement. So uh, during my presentation, I'm going to um, just provide a little bit of a background and then I will dive into two examples. Uh, I'm sure you are, you know, you would want to see what is it the Rockefeller Foundation is doing uh, in the different countries. So, 
I want to start with the slide, uh, which is in front of you. And uh, I know um, the other previous speakers have talked about um, this, so I will not uh, talk too much about it. Uh, but the, the thing which I want to really emphasize is that the current uh, food system is driving uh, more than twice its economic value. Um, if you look at that slide, this is some work which was done in the US, while the market value is estimated at around $9 trillion. Um, the, the two costs is about $28 trillion because of the health and environmental and uh, economic uh, you know, challenges when you think about um, the unhealthy diets uh, actually accounting for one in two out of the five deaths um, worldwide. Um, I need to move to the next slide. Why is it not moving? Oh, goodness. I, okay, for some reason, my slide is not moving. Um, Zhang, do you want to share my slides? Hello? Mm. Oh, all right, sorry, <laughs> sorry, it has moved. Um, yeah, so the question then is, uh, what is the Rockefeller Foundation doing? Um, as you know, the Rockefeller Foundation promotes the, the well-being of humanity by making uh, opportunity universal and sustainable. And uh, this can only happen when uh, food systems, uh, which impact every person on the planet, are transformed to be nourishing, uh, regenerative, and equitable. Um, so early this year, the Rockefeller Foundation, we launched what we call um, a good food initiative or a good strategy. Um, and in this strategy, we're going to invest $105 million over the next five years to increase uh, access to healthy uh, and sustainable diets um, for people around the globe. And uh, in particular, we are trying to look, I think the previous speaker has spoken about not just subsidizing, but we are going to look at how do we shift um, public and private uh, spending towards good food, which is nutritious, um, which is uh, also uh, regenerative and also equitable. So, and, and this strategy is also building on the Rockefeller Foundation's investment in uh, powering the food system with renewable energy, uh, where we made investments and made commitments uh, of, you know, one US uh, billion, uh, for inclusive and green recovery of, uh, from the COVID uh, pandemic. So in the next three years, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation strategy is going to focus on three levers. And uh, one of the uh, you know, levers which are going to increase access to affordable and healthier foods, and at the same time, reducing the greenhouse gases emissions. Um, and as you can see from that slide, um, we are uh, going to be uh, making investments uh, on good food, uh, data and science and innovations. Uh, and this investment is going to support a number of things, including um, metrics and data systems that better inform decision makers on the real cost and the benefits of our food. Um, this is also going to include work around the true cost uh, accounting. Uh, which is going to evaluate the cost of uh, uh, food systems beyond what the consumers pay uh, in the stores. And I think the first slide which I showed gives an example of that. Uh, on, still on that lever, we are talking about uh, standardizing and democratizing uh, principles and outcomes and metrics. Um, part of that work also includes the periodic table of food initiative, uh, which is a global effort to create the public database containing uh, comprehensive biochemical compositions and functions of most important foods uh, around the globe. Then our second lever or our second pillar is around the good food policy. And here we are looking at advancing uh, effective data-driven policies uh, that improve access to good food for millions of, of people. And uh, the final one, our lever that we are using uh, is just what uh, Francisco has talked about, the good food, um, uh, what you call the good food uh, purchasing. And the good food uh, strategy is going to look at supporting uh, large institutions, including schools and hospitals, uh, to use the existing food procurement budgets to buy and provide food uh, that benefit people and the planet. And uh, we have also worked, uh, you know, we have key partners, including um, you know, WFP, 
uh, who, are, who is our main partner working in different countries, um, you know, uh, from uh, Kenya to Burundi to Rwanda and also Benin, um, Ghana, Honduras, and India. Uh, and we're also partnering with other, you know, great partners like Agra and Harvest Plus. So, um, so that said, I, I think we have discussed here um, a lot about, uh, you know, calories. And, and we know that uh, grains actually account for uh, 30 to 60 percent of the calories. Um, and here what I'm talking about is you, you think about the maize uh, and the rice and the wheat. So whatever we are able to do to improve the diet, it, it would be very important for us to work with already existing food system. Uh, work with what is uh, already existing. But then we find, as the previous speakers have talked about, um, you know, for example, our grains is highly, highly refined. And um, this is because of a number of things, including, um, you know, it, since the 19th, 19th century, we have seen uh, the advention of the, the roller mills uh, that lowered the cost of uh, producing the refined grains. Uh, we also have consumer preferences. Um, you know, in Africa, people want to, you know, consume what looks like a cleaner product. The white IT is the better, which is highly processed. Um, you know, and, and, and those are kind of um, the, the main things. And we also know that in the past, for example, with Green Revolution, uh, there was also a lot of focus on concentration of, 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 of grains and grains. And uh, that slide just shows that when you think about um, the, the, the grains, it's only about 20% of the grain, which is actually consumed whole. And, and we do know that whole grain is, is very, very um, important. And in most cases, um, you know, the, the processors will remove the bran and the jam and just leave the endosperm. Um, well, the endosperm is good. It has a lot of it has carbohydrates, but we're also losing a lot of more nutritious products, which is actually fed. Um, you know, it's it's taken for uh, livestock consumption, and uh, the low consumption of grains, um, the whole grain we have seen is the second largest dietary risk factor. Uh, I think the previous speaker talked about uh, sodium, but you can see it's just next to sodium in terms of illnesses from poor diets uh, that contribute to uh, premature deaths is part of it is, is the whole grain. Um, but we have seen um, that trend um, is, is likely to change. One of the reasons why we ended up with the refined flour is because of, you know, the, the whole grain was not able to uh, to keep for long because um, of oxidation. Uh, but we've worked with a number of universities in the US and in South Africa to extend the shelf life uh, from about three weeks to you know, close to four and a half months in, in our projects that I'll be sharing with in Rwanda. We have also seen uh, com consumer preferences uh, beginning to change uh, for a few who really want a more, uh, more healthier diets. And, um, we have also seen, for example, even in terms of alternative uh, sources of, of, of livestock ingredients, such as uh, insect-based feed, uh, which can substitute uh, some of the, the maize and the grains that were going to, uh, to animal feed. So that's one thing, whole grain. But the second component is around fortification. It's, it's very important, and I think the previous speakers have talked about it, uh, and we know globally about 91 countries actually have policies that mandate um, fortification. But when you zoom into analyzing those countries, uh, you will find only about 18% of industrialized meal flour is actually fortified. In some countries, this may be a bit higher, but I think that's the, the average. So whatever we are going to do as the Rockefeller Foundation, we want to have fortified whole grain in, in one product. And just think about this. We have just talked about, um, we, we, we want to promote foods uh, which are also going to be nutritional positive and budget neutral. So if you think about when you take 100, and, and that's just um, an illustration, you take 100 kilograms of whole grain of maize, 
and you do whole grain, you actually get about 100, 100 kilos. That is the top part of um, uh, the slide that you're seeing here. Uh, because it has the, the bran and the, it has the endosperm and the germ. And what you see on your right is one of the products we are doing with um, a company in Rwanda. But right now the status quo is you do 100 kilograms and you throw away the good parts and you're left with only 70 kilograms. So that means by transition to health, transitioning to healthier diets, you can recover more food. I mean, it's just unbelievable that you can get 30% more food by um, uh, doing the, uh, the whole grain flour. So I want to provide uh, an example of what we are doing. Uh, and, and this is uh, the project which we started in Rwanda. And in Rwanda, um, we have worked very closely with Vanguard, with um, uh, the World Food Program and the government of Rwanda to begin to transition and shift uh, children from consuming the highly refined flour to fortified whole grain. And um, you know, some analysis that has been done by BCG that shows that uh, fortified whole grain actually contains uh, five times more nutrients. And you can see the, the numbers on, your, on the right side. And the reason why we think we need to intervene in grains, if you see uh, the, the happy children, the plate where you, which you see with the kids there, uh, almost 60% of the meal is actually corn. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's cornbread, or we call it ugali uh, here in Africa. So if there is anything intervention you can do, you can still work within the existing uh, diets without really changing uh, to a new diet. Um, so, and um, when we have tried, uh, we started with a pilot of 13,000 uh, kids. We have now at about 40,000 in 49 schools. And we have very, very good feedback from the children. Uh, they actually think uh, they prefer whole grain about 97%. And uh, when we did the, this, uh, the behavior change campaign and, and, and the following up research, 73% of the children are actually aware of the nutritional benefits of fortified whole grain. So um, our team is working very closely with the government of Rwanda, and we hope that we can scale this uh, project beyond um, the 49 schools. We are also doing, um, you know, the fortified whole grain uh, flour uh, in, in Burundi and other countries. Um, so we have established what we call the fortified whole grain alliance. Um, uh, which is going to really support and spearhead, um, uh, you know, investment in 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 whole grain, and uh, with the the partners right now being the Rockefeller Foundation, the World Food Program, DSM, BCG, and others. We are welcoming anyone else who would want to join uh, to create a movement uh, where uh, we support uh, fortification. Now, my second example is biofortified uh, crops. Um, we know globally, um, you know, in the you know since uh, maybe 2002, there has been heavy investment in biofortification, whether this is uh, wheat, rice, maize, beans, and, and, and sweet potatoes. And uh, these have been released in about 30 countries. More than 12 million farmers are already um, growing uh, biofortified beans. The samples you see there are biofortified. Actually, this is Celia. This is from uh, Tanzania, where I am right now. And uh, the high end beans can provide up to 80% of the daily requirement, um, the, the, the daily requirement for, um, for women in the productive age. And they also have benefits in terms of uh, reducing the risks of, um, uh, of, of, of heart diseases. Um, so why beans? Um, we know there is um, the triple burden of, of malnutrition and uh, the high, the, I mean, the, the iron uh, in deficiencies is there in about 2 billion people. And yet we do believe the, the common bean is uh, maybe one of the solutions. You think about that, the, the beans are actually a staple crop for uh, more than 350 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa. When you zoom into and look at the school feeding programs, you find, um, you know, a lot of schools are actually they have beans uh, as, as in the menu, and also beans have also, um, 
you know, are good, uh, especially for regenerative agriculture and improving livelihoods. And when Harvest Plus uh, did uh, some work around advancing uh, high end and zinc beans in the Rwanda, uh, because they are high in productivity, about 20% more productive, um, we found that they found that the yield advantage, um, they have a profitability of uh, an additional 57 to 78 dollars. Uh, work which has also been done to Rwanda shows that one dollar investment in high end beans translates to about three dollars gain. You know, in the light of climate change, um, we you know we've just coming from COP 27. The climate is a is a big challenge, and we we like the the beans because they are going to grow faster. Um, you know, within 75 90 days, uh, the farmer has a harvest. And they're also good in terms of uh, nitrogen uh, fixing in the light of high uh, cost of fertilizers. Are beans being eaten in schools? High iron beans being consumed in school? Yes, to some extent, but not to the quantities that we would like. Uh, in Tanzania, maybe being the leading country because of the work of Pabra and, and Siat and other partners, um, a bit more in Rwanda and um, you know, other countries, but this is not sufficient. Um, I think uh, more needs to be done. Uh, in Burundi, we have seen also high end beans being consumed, uh, blended uh, in blended porridges for children. And uh, we are going to be expanding um, the consumption of high end beans in, in Burundi uh, in partnership with WFP. Uh, just, just to show that uh, we do have enough varieties uh, for the different countries. Um, you know, in most countries, at least you have more than five varieties. And um, uh, through our partnership with Agra and Harvest Plus, we are aiming to reach 1.2 million children uh, with high end beans who are in the school feeding programs in Kenya, Tanzania, and Malawi. Um, yeah, the other thing that the Rockefeller Foundation is doing uh, for both our investments um, uh, in high end beans um, and the different uh, intervention we are making directly. Uh, we also have uh, finance is very important, innovative finance. Uh, it is said that uh, in Africa, 85% of the volume is actually traded uh, by uh, the SMEs. And, but these are also yeah, too large for the microfinance institutions and also too, too, too small for the banks. So uh, we are intervening and we set up what we call the Good Food Innovation Fund and um, which is a $5 million uh, investment, uh, you know, that uh, we have put there. And uh, we have just finished our first cohort of entrepreneurs who have won uh, 1 million and we give uh, between two, between $50,000 and $200,000. These are returnable grants to companies. Um, for example, some of those companies you see there, you may not know what exactly they're doing, uh, but some of them are doing the the fortified whole grains, some of them are doing the, um, they, they are doing fortification, others are having ready to eat um, nutritious uh, foods like Nature Lock that does, um, it pre-cooks the stews uh, for school feeding programs and all you need to do is just add water and it's, it reconstitutes back to, to a stew for children. Um, so there are just a number of, um, uh, you know, SMEs that we are helping, and we are just opening a, a, another window uh, for investment for high-end beans in uh, in Burundi. So as I finish, um, as we do this work, we are also learning. We want to learn. Uh, we want to learn, uh, and and we have some of the things which we still do not know. Um, we are looking to learn. Uh, around the imbalance between the supply and demand. When you, you know, I'm, I'm in Tanzania today and what I heard is that the consumers want the high end beans, but where are they and what is the affordable price points to make sure that there's increased adoption. Availability of the, the bean seed, for example, for high end beans is also a challenge. We don't have sufficient uh, seed multiplication going on. How do you also know that you know, the issue of traceability, that is really a high end beans. If I look at it with my naked eye, it just looks like my normal, normal bean. So how do you make sure that when we are talking about traceability, that, that really, uh, you know, we are, we are dealing with the, with the, with the high end beans. 
And then, uh, of course, you also want to learn uh, one of the proposition is that high iron beans, uh, they cook faster, but by how much uh, so that we can make a, a good case. And then also in the midst of climate change, um, we see the role of beans in contributing to regenerative agriculture. But what exactly? There are still uh, you know, many unanswered questions. So um, this is my final slide. And um, I want to say that um, at AGRF African Green Revolution Forum uh, last uh, in September, um, you know, President Kagame and uh, AGRA and um, the SDG Advocacy Group, they launched the Presidential Bean Challenge. Uh, and then that was followed by uh, launch at COP of uh, the bean is, to ha is how. This is a global movement uh, to encourage consumption of beans, um, you know, so that we can support uh, reduce malnutrition. And then uh, we're going to be partnering with uh, BCG and Agra uh, to come up with a bean strategy for Africa. So we are very, very excited about uh, the work we are doing. Uh, you know, for us, it's not just about identifying the problem, it's identifying the problem, but looking at the sweet spots, which can make a difference. And we do strongly believe that institutional procurement uh, is one of those levers. And, um, and, and when we talk about institutional procurement, it's not just about, um, uh, it's not about schools, uh, it's prisons. Uh, I know people have called me, um, you know, heads of hospitals saying, uh, can you connect us with farmers who are doing high iron and zinc beans uh, so that we can start feeding them for uh, the hospitals. So, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that was my presentation and um, uh, I'm grateful to have had this opportunity and I'm happy to answer any question that you may have. Thank you Thank so you. much, Betty. Thank you. This is really interesting. Thank you for bringing us this very interesting, very intriguing global sales stories and in different countries. And thank you so much for connecting into this conference um, from uh, Tanzania. And now I will pass on to Marco. Welcome back and please start. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Um, let me share my screen real quick and um the nice thing of uh, going last is i can build on most of what was said by uh, all of the uh, good very good and interesting presentations of the previous speakers uh, can you see my slides yes okay perfect so what i thought i'd focus on is um uh, to give a bit of an overview of options for transforming the food system um um, so as we <laughs> have already heard now multiple times, if we don't change course, we're really headed for disaster and exceeding key planetary boundaries that uh, describe a safe operating space for humanity. In order to stay within those boundaries like climate change, water use, biodiversity loss, land, um, um, land use, biogeochemical uh, uh, flows, any of the stuff that is related to the food system, we really need to throw everything at the problem that we have. And that includes large scale dietary changes towards healthier and more predominantly plant based dietary patterns, more um, adoption of um, efficient um, farm level management practices. Uh, that's uh, that's the tag uh, tag bar here, um, but also reductions in food loss and waste and maybe better economic uh, development. Um, each of those options ha has very different uh, policy implications. When we look at technologies and management practices, it's clear that there needs to be some, in, some more investment in public infrastructure, especially in low and middle income countries. Uh, for example, when we look at uh, irrigation, uh, storage, uh, um, but even the development of infrastructure when it comes to roads and transport of foods. Um, there also needs to be better farm level incentives and support support to uh, uh, adopt best available technologies, better environmental regulation, uh, for example, when it comes to water use and quality. Um, when it comes to food loss and waste, there are uh, likely different uh, policies needed depending on whether more foods are lost, it would be more low and middle income countries, or whether more foods are wasted at the household level, and there are different levers of, uh, of intervening there. For example, on the waste side, closed loop supply chains, but also changes in packaging and labeling can make a big difference, whereas at the loss, uh, at the loss end, again, it's a, a lot of um, uh, infrastructure like 
storage uh, and, and refrigeration chains uh, that are lacking at the moment. Socioeconomic development uh, uh, very heavily depend on the lack of education possibilities, especially for women, and to improve to uh, uh, the, the access to um, general and reproductive health services. Uh, so those would be the policy levers. And lastly, um, uh, dietary changes, and we heard lots about and diets, and this will also be the topic that I will be focus on, uh, focusing on going forward in the talk. Um, the literature on behavioral change seems to indicate that just providing information, which most governments have opted to do, um, uh, without providing any stronger uh, additional economic and environmental changes, has really little influence on uh, actual behavioral changes when it comes to diets. And instead, integrated multi-component approaches seem to offer the best shot at actually being successful with it. That can include uh, media and education campaigns, um, uh, like labeling and consumer information, updating national guidelines, which we have heard of, uh, about by Francesco, but they can also include fiscal measures such as taxation, subsidies, other economic in incentives, including for producers, um, local school and workplace approaches, as we have heard from uh, from Betty, uh, or what we sometimes call local environmental changes and direct restriction and mandates when we think of transfers, for example. Um, in the following, I want to go into some of them that we have done some research on. Um, on the, the National Dietary Guidelines uh, um, study, I, I will only mention it very briefly since we already heard part of it. Um, so to assess how current national dietary guidelines uh, perform with respect to health and the environment, we mapped those planetary boundaries um, that we have developed within the Eat Lancet Commission to uh, global health and environmental targets that countries have signed up on. And those include, for example, the Paris Climate Agreement, IG biodiversity targets, uh, some SDG targets related to water withdrawals and pollution, and the NCD agenda. And we developed a global sustainability test where we looked at what if everybody in the world ate according to um, the dietary guidelines of uh, um, country X. Uh, um, with the idea that if we tr uh, transgress those uh, planetary boundaries or those global health and environmental targets, then that is not an equitable share uh, and not a sufficient ambition in terms of um, those dietary uh, guidelines um, when it comes to both, both health and uh, environmental implications. Um, sure, the shocking finding was that um, hardly any dietary guideline met all those six um, targets that we uh, that we investigated, and uh, a full uh, two thirds uh, or more than two thirds of countries actually only fulfilled one or two. So uh, sometimes that, that would be often the health target and maybe the phosphor target, but all the other ones they they would not. Make. Here's a little breakdown of those, and you see that uh, most of them had the biggest problem with uh, greenhouse gas emissions and basically um, <clears throat> uh, recommending a diet that even when you factor in technological changes in the future and reductions in food loss and waste, wouldn't stay within uh, the planetary boundary or uh, of climate change or the, the Paris Climate Agreement of limiting global warming to below to uh, 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 substantially below two degrees Celsius. The reason for this is that there were really not stringent enough recommendations on limiting the consumption of animal source foods. Um, and um, um, yeah, with, without the, so those alone were enough to basically fill up uh, uh, those planetary boundaries or, or uh, environmental targets. And it was really only the, uh, for example, the Eat Lancet recommendations and the different dietary patterns compatible with those that collectively stayed within those. I mean, albeit they were constructed to be like this, right? But I think that offers a, a lens to how dietary guidelines could be reformed. For example, if they uh, included uh, uh, more quantum, quantitative targets on food groups, um, not necessary as a, a point value, but ranges, um, and uh, and be much more ambitious on animals for food consumption, which, uh, you know, in the Eat Lancer recommendations came from a survey of uh, the health literature on, on uh, healthy eating. Um, at the same time, we found that um, 
diets could be healthier if uh, uh, dietary guidelines included more concrete uh, suggestions. And as you can see, here, a third healthier than uh, national dietary guidelines, but also a third healthier than the WHO guidelines, which at the moment are fairly minimal in terms of providing uh, quantitative targets. So um, also making their sure to talking more about the really constituents, uh, 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 constituent bits of healthy diets. And uh, I, I recognize Francesco did that very much, but also providing um, concrete examples of how much of, uh, how, uh, how, uh, how many servings of each of those foods should um, should be included in a healthy diet would be very beneficial here uh, and not only on on average uh, uh, um, globally but we found that trend really in all countries here um, um, that said of course dietary guidelines are only one uh, one bit of the picture and we found that at the moment hardly any dietary hardly any country meets any of its dietary guidelines so that suggests that there really needs to be much more investment in public health promotion programs to actually uh, um, uh, help uh, citizens adopt uh, dietary guidelines. Um, one of those things are fiscal measures. And we did quite a few studies uh, on those, for example, looking at how uh, how should foods uh, how how should uh, uh, how expensive would foods be if they included a price tag for the climate change damages that are associated with the production of those foods? Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, many animal source foods would be more expensive. So when we did the study, uh, on average, beef would need to be forty percent more expensive to basically. Um, include the, uh, the cost of climate damages in, in its price of food. Since then, actually, uh, the so-called social cost of carbon that estimates those climate damage costs has almost doubled. So uh, that would be quite a bit more now. Um, and at the same time, the intended effect of that is to basically switch uh, or provide an incentive for consumers to switch away from those then more expensive foods to foods that don't have this big price tag. And you see that here that um, hardly any of the uh, healthy plant-based foods would see any increase in consumption. Um, uh, that said, um, uh, equity issues and food security issues are, of course, super important. So we ran through 15 different tax scenarios that uh, sometimes shrank the tax base to only animal source foods or only ruminant animals. Uh, uh, run, uh, products from un ruminant animals that are uh, particularly high in environmental impact. Um, to, and we also coupled it with income compensation, either just recycling the income from uh, or the tax revenues from those taxes back to the consumer or using it to subsidize, for example, fruit and vegetable consumption or any health public health promotion program that would in incentivize um, uh, higher consumption of healthy, healthy and more sustainable foods. And with that, we found that uh, we could find one tax, at least one tax regime in every country where you would get um, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and um, uh, health benefit. And the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, they were at the scale of one gigaton for even this fairly moderate uh, carbon uh, damage price. So that is more than all, all, uh, um, uh, um, all transport, uh, um, aviation, all aviation transport uh, put together. So more than all flying, uh, flying emissions. Uh, this is a breakdown of uh, the kinds of uh, design options for the different countries. So in high income countries, it made sense to basically um, levy a climate damage uh, uh, costs on all foods and then use them for public health promotion programs, whereas in low income countries, uh, um, because there is a, 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 a um, high risk for uh, food insecurity impacts, it made more sense in a lot of them to constrict the tax base to really only the very highly uh, highest polluting ones, and then again use the revenues for public health promotion programs. You can do the same uh, coming from the health side. So the Cancer Agency of the World Health Organization has declared uh, uh, red meat and processed red meat as uh, carcinogenic and likely carcinogenic, which of course raises the question, well, should those uh, uh, um, uh, should those prices maybe also be adjusted? I mean, similar to tobacco to basically um, uh, um, protect populations from, uh, um, uh, uh, um, from high consumption of those uh, cancer-related foods. 
Um, so we calculated in a study how expensive should uh, red and processed meat actually be in order to absorb the cost of illness uh, associated with treating um, um, diet-related diseases that are associated with high consumption of red and processed meat. And we found that, for example, in high-income countries, um, unprocessed red meat should be about a third more expensive and processed red meat uh, uh, almost double in cost in order to absorb uh, those costs. And that really much goes back to this uh, idea, uh, I think that, Be that Betty mentioned in, in the very beginning of her talk, the true cost of food. Um, oh yeah, and we found again that uh, either of those changes would uh, uh, either of those tax um, uh, uh, tax policies would result in, in in a health benefit. Both of those costs uh, um, represent an important external uh, or externality of the food system, and uh, if you included that in the price of foods, um, the Prior, the cost of healthier and more sustainable dietary patterns that, that you see here uh, uh, with examples of uh, flexitarian, vegetarian, and vegan dietary patterns would be much, much cheaper than um, uh, relatively than uh, if you wouldn't include those. Um, and indeed, together with um, other food system measures, we found that basically this kind of full cost or true, co true cost accounting approach would contribute to going from a situation where now uh, lots of people in, especially in Africa uh, and South Asia, cannot afford a healthy and sustainable diet. Here, with an example of a well-balanced flexitarian diet, um, um, could contribute to going forward with more countries being afford, uh, being able to afford those diets. Um, already, quite many more in the medium term. If we included uh, full cost accounting, uh, less food loss and waste, and uh, um, beneficial economic development to 2050, where basically all countries uh, would be able to afford uh, uh, such a diet. So uh, that is an important takeaway that um, you know this full cost accounting, even though sometimes it's uh, uh, phrased as oh this is a tax taxes are never good for poor people actually if you implement them well uh, and they work such that they encourage consumption of healthier and more sustainable dietary patterns they're not only good for health the environment they're also actually uh, in many cases more affordable for, for households already now for many in higher income countries uh, lastly, uh, uh, the last point I want to touch on is that, um, of course, um, when we talk about dietary change, we think about policies at the consumption side. But since it, this is a whole question about food system transformation, we also need to think about uh, um, policies at the production side that help transform uh, the food system from that angle, um, which will then filter through to consumption. Um, Here's a projection of how much more we need to produce uh, um, in order to basically uh, provide the foods that, for example, a flexitarian diet or ve vegetarian vegan diets uh, would, would need. And all of them have been associated to be more healthy and sustainable. So the upshot here is that instead of ever producing more staple crops, sugar, animal source foods, we really need um, less of those and much more of fruits, vegetables, uh, legumes, nuts and seeds. One way of doing that is reforming agricultural subsidies. At the moment, lots of them um, are not provided, uh, are not coupled to the production of uh, different foods. But if you look at how are they used, then we see that lots of them are used in the production of foods that are not terribly healthy and sustainable. Here you can see um, less than a quarter is used, for example, to produce fruits and vegetables. So um, basically looking at different ways of maybe providing those subsidies with more strings attached towards the production of healthy and sustainable food commodities could be one way of addressing this. Um, and with a call with my colleague Florian Freud, we run through a couple of uh, different uh, subsidy reform scenarios um, where we said, OK, uh, put, let's say, 50 percent of subsidies towards the production of healthier and more sustainable foods, meaning fruits, vegetables, legumes and nuts and seeds. Uh, or putting 100% in there, or reforming the, uh, um, and in addition, reforming the global subsidy scheme. So subsidies are provided at a GDP, at a percentage of GDP, or at a percentage of population. Um, and here left, you see removal of subsidies. Um, the takeaway message here is that um, indeed, greater coupling could contribute to uh, uh, an increase in the production of horticultural products of up to 20% in OECD countries. That's quite a lot. 
Now, debt production would actually get, go down um, if we re remove the subsidies. And if you had also global restructuring and subsidies, you would have a more equitable uh, distribution in terms of who produces those. Um, that would have knock-on effects on consumption, about uh, a, a half uh, in, in size. And if you put uh, the health impacts of that consumption together with the economic impacts, then we saw that uh, if you indeed take half of those subsidies, uh, you wouldn't there wouldn't be an economic penalty. Because usually it said the more restrictive you are in your economy, the more of an economic penalty you get, uh, because you, you get more into this plan economy idea. Uh, but if we use half of them and we have a healthier workforce, those two aspects balance each other and you have a, a no, uh, no economic um, uh, uh, um, uh, detriment here. Um, you can even get positive economic feedbacks if you have a global subsidy reform, and that might be something to look at uh, for the more longer term. Um, okay, um, I think I'm through. I tried to talk fast, so uh, we still have time for a discussion. Um, the uh, takeaway points here are... Um, I think a healthy uh, um, healthy diets and sustainable food systems are uh, achievable, but they indeed will require strong regulations and the right incentives. Uh, they need to be mindful of local context and region specific. Um, for all of the studies we do, we usually produce quite a wealth of data uh, for each country in the world. So hopefully those can be a, um, a starting point for people working on the ground and policymakers. Um, uh, the important uh, thing to keep in mind, inaction is really not an option. Um, um, if we don't do anything, we're headed for disaster with increases, further increases in both the health and environmental costs of our diets. Uh, so um, we better get going and do something about it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marco. I think you've made a really nice mirroring of your opening talk and also give us a really nice wrap up of the at the end of the presentation and uh, really highlight a lot of very um, key takeaway home uh, key takeaway messages. So now we are indeed moving um, towards this very exciting panel discussion section. And uh, while I might pitch questions to some specific, specific speakers, you're more than welcome to just add on as you see fit uh, while we are having this conversation. So Betty, since you mentioned about this COP27 and we know that yes, finally this year in COP27, at COP27, uh, food systems um, have its pavilion and it's put on the top agenda. So, but also we, we, we've learned from this COP27 conversation that Africa is particularly vulnerable to climate change. And we also see that the food security in Africa has been particularly badly impacted by this ongoing conflict in Ukraine and the kind of um, on the brink so food supply chains. So you've mentioned about this grand um, fortification and lots of very exciting programs. And would you like to share some, some insights or some experiences regarding how important is local food system transformation and their role um, can play and, and the role smallholder farmers can play in strengthening uh, the food system resilience in African region? Yeah, thank you. And that's a, that's a very good question. Um, my understanding is that if you look at our food systems in Africa, um, we have neglected, and in the light of the climate change, as you put it, we have neglected the crops that were resilient and uh, which can easily adapt to climate change. And we have focused only on the maize, rice, and wheat. Um, but we do know, for example, uh, the amount of rains which are required for something like um, sorghum or millet or cassava or yams, those are very, very nutritious foods. But yet in Africa, they actually call the orphan crops. So there is an opportunity for us to begin to rethink uh, about our foods um, that are more nutritious and more adaptable to climate change. 
and definitely the smallholder farmers have a role to play. Uh, the smallholder farmers actually produce, um, you know, more than maybe 80% of the foods that we are eating in Africa. So we need to build their capacity to be resilient. And one of the, you know, one of the areas maybe I didn't talk about much is how do we regenerate our African soils? We know, for example, 30% to 40% of our soils are degraded. And the way we have been farming, we have been very, very extractive. You know, it's every season comes, you do uh, the seeds and the fertilizer. And, and we are not taking time to rebuild our soils using the principles of regenerative agriculture. So I do believe that uh, we can change the, the food composition that we are eating. Uh, I was just having a conversation today around the sweet potatoes, for example. It's a good meal. I mean, it's very healthy, uh, especially the ones which are biofortified. Um, and, and, but, but yet we need to also make sure that we're improving, the smallholder farmers are improving their farming practices and they are, you know, considering regenerative agriculture. But when I mean by regenerative farming, um, you know, we need to um, do more of minimum tillage. Uh, the African farmers also need to do a lot of mulching. Uh, you need to mulch the soil so that you're not having a lot of evaporation. And also, you know, use of, of livestock manure It's uh, and, and agroforestry is one of those things, some of the many things that one can do. So I think there is a role for them to play, but we also have to ex extend the diversity of the diets uh, that, that we are eating and accept um, that our traditional food system was also very, very healthy. Thanks a lot, Betty. That's, you raised a lot of good points. And one thing I kind of linked to Marco's presentation is that smallholder farmers also need support. And Marco mentioned about the role of agriculture subsidies that could play and how we can redistribute the tax revenues. I mean, it could be locally, but also globally, especially from if we think of the role of trade. So Marco, would you like to comment on how um, agriculture subsidies may play a role in supporting smallholder farmers, especially if you may comment on um, from the global sales aspect? Yeah, at the moment, actually, the um, the provision of subsidies, especially in low income countries, is very low. So we did another follow up study on this global one where we looked at sub-Saharan African countries. And uh, even if you put all sub-Saharan African countries together, it's, I think, even a, a, a very small number, uh, just a few million in subsidies that are provided there, just because <clears throat> countries are very there and it doesn't seem to be a priority so in our scenarios for global subsidy reform we do call out that um any um any basically greater provision of subsidies in um in low uh low income countries they would probably need to be uh somehow co-financed by development aid for example um um and that would be in the interest actually of uh the global north i mean we did find basically reduction uh, uh, improvements in economic performance if there was a better um uh, equitable sharing of subsidies um, just because of the basically global market impacts of having foods produ produced in in different regions and um um, um and as a as a result um um the consumption um, uh, um uh, being more balanced so um there there is a good um good motivation for providing transfer payments from the global north to the global south um then how to use them that is obviously every every country's uh, business to sort out but we do find if we couple them um that could be a good starting point um you might want to go much more detailed than just looking at food groups you can go uh, also at the ecosystem service level and see what kind of production practices should be rewarded um including uh, crop rotation uh, no tillage and um, um intercropping all those things that that betty mentioned that are sometimes described as uh, you know agroecological uh, approaches basically Thanks a lot, Marco. That's that's really useful. And I guess like we're, now we're talking about the production side and if we move on to more consumption side or let's say um, something about nutrition, 
I, I wonder, like we're, we're talking about this um, global collaboration and also contextualize um, the things regionally at regional local level. So I wonder, um, Francisco, you've mentioned about this uh, nutrition guidance implementation, especially from this practical aspect. How, how do you see um, the nutrition guidelines from bodies like World Health Organization could help to, to make more effective and realistic um, deploy of, of the sustainable nutrition, sustainable driven nutrition uh, guide, guidelines? Well, I think, you know, first of all, I hear what Marco has told us uh, several times. So uh, we have to be a bit more specific. And uh, we're actually doing that. So, so we're preparing a paper, particularly on the issue of meat. Now, you know, giving specific recommendation on a, on a, on a food is, is not an easy task. So, so we're going to do that, but, you know, probably will take some time. But what we've decided to do is to bring together the evidence around the red meat and at least say, can we provide countries an argument to set limits? So this is not about giving a number. Uh, which would be valid for everybody, but basically saying, you know, look, there's no point uh, from the point of view of uh, your health and, and certainly from the point of view of sustainability to consume, uh, you know, uh, 200 grams per day of, of red meat. So, so what is a reasonable, let's say, bracket of consumption? I think that would be the first step. And that's the thing we, we would like to do. Uh, but then I agree, we have to do it uh, somehow. The, this would based dietary guidelines should uh, be translated into maybe numbers. The complexity there is that, uh, of course, we have different cultures. And as you all know, the challenge that we had uh, when uh, the Eat Lanted Commission uh, document uh, was published was to say, oh, but you want to have everybody eating the same diet all over the world, which is, of course, not the case. But I think that, uh, you know, local contextualization of uh, composition of the diet will, you know, makes, makes the, the actual amount of food a bit more challenging to do. But I definitely think that that's something we, we would need to do because, you know, for, for all the reasons we've, we've, we've discussed today, I mean, you need to do planning. So you need to have some uh, 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 production and consumption targets for different categories of food. So I think it's, uh, I think it's coming. Uh, but but I, as I said, I think we need to sort of uh, start challenging the, the enormous uh, overconsumption levels. I think that that's a starting point. And we need to change that culture progressively. Um, last uh, week, yeah, I think it was, oh, it was early this week, early this week in, at COP27, um, for the first time we had uh, a good discussion about uh, uh, nutrition. So we have a nutrition initiative called ICANN and it was supported by the Egyptian government and several other countries in which they are basically you know, taking note of the fact that, you know, it's not only about adaptation, it is about mitigation as well. So, uh, you know, at least some countries are uh, willing to start discussing and potentially including in their national, uh, nationally determined contribution, some of these targets. So I think we need to give them the ammunition to do that. So that's why I'm saying, you know, let's start saying, and I think, you know, we have, we've heard today a lot of very interesting, concrete potential targets. Let's give them those targets. It's not, it's not the end of the story and it's not you know, the ideal level, but at least we are going to be able to give them some concrete uh, uh, you know, objectives to work towards. Thanks a lot, Francisco. Yeah, exactly. As you said, first, um, the very concrete, very solid, good guidance at a top level and then contextualize, specialize them to the different contexts so that everybody can benefit from that and minimize the potential trade-offs. And since Francisco raised a really interesting point and um, Francesca touched upon that um, in her presentation about this meat um, alternative proteins, which can be a potential um, alternative to meat-based food, which is also becoming more and more um, important uh, in dietary guidelines and also uh, from the marketing, from a policy perspective. So, um, Francisca, I'm, I'm wondering that um, given that our world is undergoing public crisis, um, the pandemic, be it the climate change and the uh, ongoing war and unrest, geopolitical tensions, to what extent would the 
system shocks challenge the translation to alternative proteins, as, as you show in your presentation, able, um, the plant-based um, approach will take a big role there. So would you like to um, share some of your, some of your insights? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question, actually. So I would say in terms of the role of alternative proteins, I'm not sure if it's so much shocks or if it's just the trends, uh, several trends in our world that will make the big shift if we go the alternative protein route or not. And so there are two strands of argumentation. One, one, one group um, says, of course, we need alternative protein because our projections show that we don't only have population growth, but also growth of um, that, like we have dietary shift preferences and people consume, want to consume more and more meat. And then there are the other group who says, well, but actually we don't need to increase um, meat demand. We can also shift to more healthy diets. So you have basically an argumentation and this is why it's quite a controversial topic, sometimes very heated actually. Um, and the one group says, well, we can't tell people how, what preferences they should have. And we know, especially in Asia, demand for meat is really increasing because people earn more money. Meat has often a status symbol. I can afford to eat meat every day. So this gives me a kind of um, better status. And so then people say, yeah, we should offer those people then alternatives uh, that are less damaging to environment. But as I have also shown purely from their dietary guidelines, and I think this came across all our presentations, uh, it is not required that we eat more protein, also not alternative or meat-based. So I would say it depends. Do we go for behavioral change or do we accept that people have their preferences and then go with it? And I think depending on which, which route we will go, uh, this will decide on the future of alternative protein products. I see. Thanks a lot, Francisca. And yeah, I, I now get the point where I'm where I'm um, kind of wondering of, but thanks a lot for this very inside comments. Just following this um, um, alternative protein topic, from the nutrition aspect, um, Francisco, would you like to comment on um, can such alternative um, proteins meet nutritional requirements without introducing other problems? For example, do, do you see um, if there's any risks associated with consuming a high proportion of um, ultra processed foods. I think Francesca already mentioned uh, the key point here. This is not about protein. <laughs> this is about animal source food, which is a complex thing. We, we actually don't even know uh, uh, exactly what of this uh, component is important for healthy growth. We, we call it the meat factor, inverted commas, because we don't know. It's probably zinc, it's, it's a certain micronutrient, it's a combination of them. Sometimes it could be certain growth factor. So, but it, I don't think that that's a big issue. I mean, I don't think we're going to have big shortage of that. But yeah, certainly, I mean, the kind of uh, uh, meat replacement that we see on the market now are not healthy foods. I mean, that's a, that's a reality. They are way high in, in sodium, and uh, yeah, they are ultra processed. I mean, that's that's a reality. And so, also in terms of fat, is not a is not an ideal profile. I mean, probably they can be improved. I mean, I, I think that there's a space there. But I think what is more interesting is sort of the, let's say the novel foods. I think there is, there is a space there. We need to also to be concerned about the safety of that. Uh, WHO and FAO are actually starting, you know, this kind of risk assessment. And we would like to have a comprehensive risk assessment, which exactly uh, answers this question. I mean, on the one hand, you know, the nutritional challenges. On the other hand, the food safety challenges. Uh, uh, but I think, you know, we need to be, uh, you know, uh, more forward looking. So this is not only about that particular uh, source of food, but you know we need to be concerned about overall how we feed the world. What are the novel sources sources of food? And actually, it's not it's not probably food from 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 land. It's probably food from water, not necessarily aquaculture. It's algae. I mean, there's a lot of potential from other uh, sources of food which we need to consider carefully, and then include in our in our analysis. Uh, but then, you know, with a with a with a um, um, system wide approach, uh, uh, you know, for example, if you think of the another very important source uh, um, of nutrients, which could be the insects. Uh, okay, we I mean, try to uh, actually breed insects. Uh, how do you feed them? How do you feed them on what? I mean, do you feed them on waste? And you know, they could become concentrators of pesticides. 
So I mean, the, I mean, there's the, the, there are a number of considerations we we need to make, but. I certainly think that we need to, you know, have a much broader view than just thinking, okay, how do we fill the protein gap? It's, it, that's, that's, that's not the issue. We need to see how we feed the world in a balanced way, uh, considering, you know, the kind of foods we have, considering alternative foods, and, and then looking at best scenarios in terms of, uh, you know, economic development and health and environmental impact. Thank you so much, Francisco, for bring bring us this very timely and very very broad picture and balanced um, insights. That that's you you mentioned quite a few important points that we need to consider that how we can make the diets more sustainably, but also healthy and fairly, and um, to to benefit um, at a broader level, create um, optimize the social welfare. So um, that leads to my last question as we're also running out of the time, which I would like to address to you all, to each of you. As you're aware um, of that, one of the motivations for today's event was the diverse debates sparked by the 2019's Eat Lansen Commission, um, which he, each of you, I believe, have mentioned a couple of times. In about a year, we will see the publication of a follow-up to this report. And today, we're really lucky um, to have some of the commissioners on our panel. So I'd like to hear your insight or recommendations regarding, in your opinion, what do you think um, are the key gaps that Eat Lansen 2.0 should tackle or take part on? Um, maybe Marco would like to start? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I think uh, Francesco mentioned already what sort of went wrong in the communication of the first Eat Lancet report, right? This idea that everybody has to sort of eat the same diet, right? Which was uh, not intended to uh, to be what, what we recommend in the first round. But I think uh, the second uh, report gives us an opportunity to set that uh, clear in a much uh, more comprehensive way. So we'll try to be very, uh, in, include many different socioeconomic, uh, sociodemographic groups. So we'll have uh, also when it comes to inclusivity. So we'll look at um, uh, different sexes, different age groups, uh, rural, urban uh, groups. Uh, what what is eaten there? What are the impacts, environmental impacts uh, for those groups? Um, and really discuss a little bit um, uh, the the barriers for for adoption of healthy and sustainable diets, but also the opportunities for those different groups. But I'm very um, very curious to hear what what others say we should include because we we are we're still working on it, so we can uh, include things. <laughs> totally. Thanks, Marco. Um, Francisca, would you like to add on something? Um, sure. I'm not sure if you said Francesca, Francesco, but <laughs> very similar names, um, but I'll, I'll just go. Um, yeah, no, I think I also have the feeling that um, the Eat Lancet Commission was very well aware of the criticism and the aim to do better in terms of context-specific information. And what I would recommend, and I think that they are doing that as well, is to really co-design with local uh, people and not have like a bunch of Western, like US and European experts tell the world what to eat and what not to eat. And as far as I know, uh, the commission is conducting consultation rounds with people around the globe at the moment. So I think they took that uh, into account. And I think this is really key, the co-design um, effect and, and aspect and to really work together with the people in the country so to not come across as the expert from the west telling people what to do thank you so much that's really helpful francisco yeah yeah so and i think frankly that i found the, the policy of the european commission one of the most advanced in the world i mean the farm to fork policies i mean you mentioned that uh, not everybody agrees to that and that's true <laughs> uh, and you know the implementation of that policy is going to face a number of challenges i mean the uh, the, the commercial interests are, are strong there so what could you do I mean, one of the things the commission for example asked us to do is to help uh, on the on the labeling and, and trying to find a way to inform consumers about uh, the environmental impact uh, of, of products so I think that that's uh, that's an interesting one. So, you know, could the Eat Planted Commission um, um, look at uh, 
maybe the kind of innovation uh, on, on, on how um, uh, people are informed about uh, about that because it's actually frankly not easy to make it, to make a choice uh, so uh, so empowering a bit more the the, 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 the people uh, to, to, to do to do that I think that would be a, a useful one then I think understanding a bit more the but that's somehow the outcome of the food system economic commission so uh, understanding a bit the um, the challenges of the politics and, and what are the potential leverages for, for, for the positive change. I think that would be another one. So, because, you know, this has always been interpreted as, uh, okay, this is punitive for certain things. And, uh, and then, the, 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 you know, the, 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 those who have commercial interest in the livestock sector, you know, start fighting and, and undermining everything. Um, you know, what are the potential uh, uh, economic drivers that would make this also interesting from the point of view of the, of the economic development? I think Marco was saying, saying some of that in his presentation. I, I found that particularly helpful, particularly interesting. Thank you, Thank you so much, Francesco. Um, Betty, would you be able to share oh, your sorry. Sorry, my, my light up disappeared, so I'm totally in darkness. Uh, no, I, I, I really don't have uh, much to add, uh, but on the, you know, the, the, the new report, I think for, for me, what I would also recommend is, um, you know, just like the others have said, maybe also more consultation with the indigenous communities. I, I know when, for example, I was growing up, um, you know, you could easily find uh, pumpkins in our meals. So like, also, I think we need to also look at what were the diets like uh, before we transition to unhealthier diets and see uh, whether we can twist back our steps uh, and, and see whether we can have better foods. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Betty, for bringing this indigenous um, aspect and the importance of local communities. And um, with that, Thank you, Francesca, Francesco, Betty, and Marco for your participation in this session and bring us the incredible conversation about dietary shifts and food system transformation. And with that, we're closing to the end of this whole event. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to express our sincere appreciation to all speakers, both yesterday and today, for their engagement with this event, and we can never make this happen without you all. As you may observe during the sessions yesterday and today, our fundamental purpose of this event is to bring together related but different communities from across disciplinary conversation about one of the world's most pressing challenges. How do we feed the world now having 8 million people sustainably, healthily, and fairly? As mapped out in the plenary talk from Professor Jessica Benso, we need to fix the broken food system to deliver inclusive diets without compromising planetary boundaries. But the transformation isn't easy given the complexity of our food systems, such that a tiny change will affect stakeholders societal-wide. Indeed, as discussed in session one, inequality challenges are widespread along food value chains, and the gaps are particularly huge for the already vulnerable ones. And as unpacked in session two, at both local and global levels, enhance the resilience of our food systems in a warming world is urgently needed. In session three that we just had earlier this morning, we learned that there are various barriers to making good food governance and we need effective policies and measures to establish coordinated governance frameworks. And in this final session, we've discussed different levers that can steer us towards an effective and realistic food systems transformation and healthy and sustainable diets that are economically available, culturally acceptable and respect to the earth. This event was conceptualized by One Nurse, the Cell Price Flagship Journal of Sustainability Science, and MAD, Cell Price Flagship Journal of Clinical and Translational Research. We deeply believe that only via collaborations through interdisciplinary research and transdisciplinary collaborations more broadly is the way to resolve societal grant challenges. 
I would like to also take this opportunity to also thank my co-host, Dr. Um, Swapnika Ramu, and this event won't be made possible without the incredible help from my teammates at One Earth and the leading organizers of Cellcrest Lab Links, as well as our amazing marketing and produ production teams. Thank you all very much again for joining us at this event. I feel myself have learned a lot, and I hope you all also have a better understanding of the pressing challenges and exciting opportunities towards a better food systems for a better future. We hope that you all enjoy this event. A recording will be made available in, in the coming weeks, and we very much look forward to collaborating with you on this topic and bringing more similar events on other topics in the near future. Thank you all, and bye-bye. Take care. Goodbye.